Hello to everyone and welcome. I'm Katie Coleman with the Museum Council of Greater Philadelphia. We'll be starting in just a minute, hoping that more of our signed up participants can hop on. Okay, we still have some other signed up that we have not gotten yet, but I want to make most use of our time. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, again, I'm Katie Coleman. I'm with the Programming Committee of the Museum Council of Philadelphia. Uh, and just a short note about us. The Museum Council of Greater Philadelphia was founded in 1939 by a consortium of area museums seeking to promote public awareness of local cultural institutions. Today, our mission is to build connections between and among the diverse museum and cultural community provide opportunities for, for professional growth, share best practices, and promote accomplishments in the field. And we are extremely excited tonight to have Alfonso Atkins from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Bethany Chisholm from the Rosenbach, and Susan Schifrin from Arts Philadelphia to talk about DEAI and their organizations, uh, the challenges they face as they are continually working with DEAI, and the achievements that they have made. So I'd like for everyone to be able to introduce themselves first, and I'm going to go in straight up alphabetical order. Uh, so uh, Al, could you start? Sure. Thank you, Katie. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, nice to, I think, kind of see you all. I'm still negotiating the virtual space, but um, Alfonso Atkins, uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Deputy Director of DEIA, at least as it's phrased here, of course, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, accessibility. So um, I had just got here eight months ago. Uh, so for a lot of folks, I think that's still new. Uh, but uh, I'm really happy to be here, really happy to learn from all of you, and uh, can't wait to hopefully meet you all, uh, hopefully in person sometime soon. Take care. Thanks, Al. Uh, Bethany. Hi, everyone. My name is Bethany Chisholm. I am the Director of Development at the Rosenbach Museum and Library. I've been there for about three years, and I, my entire career, I've been in fundraising for nonprofits in Philadelphia. Um, and so I have a lot of experience being often the only person of color um, in my department, nevertheless, the, maybe the whole organization. Um, so I have a lot of lived experience and um, thoughts and feelings about DAI that I have brought into um, forming the work that we do at the Rosenbach. I'm excited to talk about it tonight. Thanks, Bethany. Uh, Susan. Um, Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here with my colleagues. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm Susan Schifrin. I'm the founder and director of Arts Philadelphia, which is a service organization that provides opportunities for cultural interactions among people living with dementia, their care partners, and the wider community. And um, I've spent most of my career working in museums. Um, I founded Arts Philadelphia in 2013, and um, from its very conception, Arts Philadelphia 
is an organization founded around the priority of accessibility and inclusion um, for people who are too often marginalized um, and not seen and not heard. Um, and um, I guess as we get into our conversations later, I'll talk a little bit more about the further diversification that we've been going through over the last five or six years. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Susan. Uh, so each of you are coming from an organization that is approaching this in a different way due to the nature of your organization, the size, the history. So I think we'd like to hear a little bit about how each institution is approaching DAI. Uh, and I'd like to start with Bethany from Rosenbach on this because you have formed a committee. We have formed a committee. Um, at this point, we meet uh, once a quarter. We were meeting um, every month and then we realized one of the lessons that we learned um, through all of this is that um, often meetings, uh, what comes out of meetings is a very large task list and um, all of those responsibilities kind of get spread around and then no one's really um, owning what needs to get done. So I think that when you meet once per quarter, it can really help you focus on what your goals are, find some action items, and then when you come back together, um, you can more realistically um, report on what you've done and show um, those metrics that we're always looking for. Um, the committee, of course, came um, out of a response from the modern civil rights movement of the summer of 2020. Um, we were already doing a lot of DAI work, but the committee um, was one of the things that we decided we need to do to force accountability and visibility with the work that we were doing at the Rosenbach. Um, and from that committee, we also came out with our list of commitments that you can view on our website. It's under our About Us tab, um, rosenbach.org forward slash commitments. Um, and we worked on those as committee um, and we reached out to our entire small staff of 18 people um, to find different ways that each department could make a commitment um, that is results oriented so that we can put that to paper of what we've accomplished in that time in between meetings. Um, and that committee is made up of staff members. There's at least one um, person from each department. And then um, we have a couple of guides who are um, like docents at the Rosenbach. Um, and then we had one intern and we had one community member um, who has sometimes helped us um, do programming, but is also a member and a friend of the Rosenbach. So it was a good mix of different people from the Rosenbach represented. Can I ask, did you recruit from all of those places or was that sort of the energy brought them to you? We uh, recruited. So first we went to the staff and said, you know, if you have the time and the energy because of these things, if you tell someone, you know, you're going to be on this committee, um, that's not going to bring the best energy to that effort. So we asked for volunteers who could have the time and had the, um, the commitment to the work. Um, and then we asked those who joined from the staff to think of who they know. Um, so including interns, volunteers, um, guides, um, community members who would also be interested and have a stake in the Rosenbach in the work that we're doing. So that's how uh, non-staff members came to the committee. Uh, thank you. I would like to move to Philadelphia Museum of Art because they were uh, pretty impressive in creating their own, a new department basically for DAI. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, <clears throat> as I understand it and have done some research, um, I think much like Bethany's organization as well, I think there was a lot that was done in response, I think, um, to the happenings of 2020 um, at the time. And, you know, it was under the leadership actually of an interim um, director, Nicole Allen White, who's still with the museum, uh, but is serving as our Director of Government Relations and External Affairs that the museum embarked upon, uh, really uh, museum-wide comprehensive training, uh, which was pretty interesting. They started with um, really a training in anti-racism and trying to understand the characteristics of white supremacy. So we engaged 
to have a training of consultant uh, from outside the museum to come in and really, I think, develop this kind of working vocabulary of examining policies and practices that likely had characteristics that needed to be addressed so that we could, I think, you know, more properly lay the groundwork for what we saw as our statement of principles, which are kind of our public pronouncements of goals that we're seeking to achieve. And I think one of the cool things is that in the time that I've been here, about eight months, we were almost exactly where we needed to be in kind of learning the institution, at least for myself, and then gathering the information that was necessary to really deliver on these goals. So we have, you know, some pretty standard goals about engaging, I think, community in the development of exhibitions and programs, talking very specifically about cultivating a culture of belonging and inclusion, uh, expanding our collection to feature more uh, artists from historically underrepresented backgrounds, and then of course, increasing really our collaborations and partnerships with uh, diverse companies. And one of the things that has been great is building uh, what I call an equity audit process. It's really an infrastructure to really collect, collect a lot of the information across our operational departments to really see like, you know, what people have been doing um, so far and some of the ongoing efforts. And I'm happy to say that it's amazing, I think, how much work is being done. Um, and I think right now we're right at the point where uh, I just finished really phase one of that audit process and, and we're moving into the museum, I think, adopting the next phase of its kind of training platform. So a lot of what will come next will really be trying to execute on three big containers of how we think about, I think, our values, uh, because we look at diversity, equity, and of course, access and inclusion as core values of the museum how we talk about those values and then how we act on them through the policies and practices that we create. So um, there's been a lot of groundwork that has been done. And to be fair, much of that work took place, I think even previous to 2020, but it's great because I'm starting to, I think, get the rhythms of the institution and feeling them really starting to talk about this work and talk about their work differently, which is great. So been a neat neat learning experience so far. Great. Uh, Susan, Arts Philadelphia is different in, in some ways because you don't have a physical location and you've been working with a consulting guidance group called Of By For All. What has that been like for you guys? Um, so I, I mean I'm, I'm mindful that in this group we have representation of a large museum a smaller museum, and then a microscopic community organization. Um, and I would say there are actually advantages to being microscopic, not in terms of fundraising, not in terms of all of the other things, but in terms of doing this kind of work. Um, of by for all, I, I would say, um, is a membership organization rather than a consulting organization. And we were incredibly fortunate, especially given our microscopic nature, that um, we were um, accepted by of by for all to be part of their first wave um, in 2018. And of by for all, for those who don't know it, is the um, <clears throat> The Labor of Love of Nina Simon. Um, it's an organization created specifically to assist cultural organizations in examining how they engage with their communities, how they even define their communities, and to honestly and with humility and open eyes um, revise those organizations revise those um, connections in ways that forefront the community and require the organization to step back a little bit. Um, we were a whopping organization of two <laughs> when we started with Of By For All. 
Um, and it, it, our, our joining of by for all coincided with our having made our first steps towards um, building partnerships around the notion of neighborhood specificity, um, cultural specificity, um, ethnic, racial specificity in terms of working with people living with dementia and their care partners in ways specific to how they were living their experiences. Of By For All really helped us to um, think carefully, thoughtfully, and to immediately start with the community and shape our how we envision these partnerships um, based on community drivers. Um, so I, I started by saying that being microscopic can be an advantage. Um, you know, I, um, I know this is a question that's gonna come up later, but the only, the only permission I had to get for this work was my own. Um, and that's a huge, um, a huge blessing. Um, and I will just say that many of my colleagues in Out By For All were really struggling with not having that liberty to move as they saw it. Um, but anyway, that's, that's a place to start. Thanks, Susan. Um, I just want to let everybody know who's listening and watching. If you have questions for everyone in general or for anyone specific, feel free to drop them into the chat. Uh, we might incorporate them in the next 45 or 30 minutes or so, uh, or we might conquer them towards the end of the hour. Um, going off of Susan, what she said about sometimes getting buy-in from the higher management and from boards, uh, we have to think about not only to first work with DAI, but also in every effort after that, you still need to get that buy-in. How are you guys dealing with that uh, in your each institution? And do you have any advice for people who are looking, trying to, to gather support from higher ups in their institutions? This is open for whomever feels inspired. I, it, I'll, I'll start. One of the things that of By For All equipped us with was a set of tools to address that particular thorny issue. Um, and one of, the, one of the scenarios that we were invited to contemplate was, you know, number one, um, who are the communities we as an organization serve? and to ask our board, who are the communities we serve? And then to envision five years from now, what would our service look like and who would it include? And who would we reach out to as a way of increasing our inclusiveness and et cetera? Um, I was quite surprised in the best way possible by the thoughtfulness of my board. Um, I actually, in all honesty, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but it's a very different board now. I was not sure that my board would grasp or want to grasp the significance of the call to be of by for all. They were amazing um, and I think that kind of um, conversation that doesn't pit um, staff against board, but really um, allows for some common ground, it was incredibly helpful to us. So that's, that is one thing that I would um, very much recommend. So there's a bit of a Socratic method approach uh, 
leading people through questions. I, Art Museum and Rosenbach are known as very old institutions uh, with all the, the glory and problems that come with that. Uh, for institutions closer, more similar to those, what might be some challenges and possibly ways to overcome those challenges? We were thinking about the board and again, making sure that the higher levels are on board with uh, DAI. Uh, I can speak to that. Um, so for both. So I have a really wonderful, very engaged board. Um, it is a traditional Philadelphia cultural, you know, nonprofit board of directors. Um, they're all there because they love um, special collections and rare books. And that's what the Rosenbeck does. And we also have a very full calendar of programs and events um, that are inspired by our collection. And I think one of the challenges that came out of DAI work is that for a long time, um, the Rosenbach kind of functioned under the banner of, you know, we do Western literature, we do um, American and British literature, that's what we're known for. And I think that when you're that small, you know, we have a staff of 18, it used to be much smaller than that. Um, you have such a slim budget there is risk in moving away from what you know is popular and what you know that people will um, you know, respond positively to. So veering away from James Joyce and Shakespeare and Herman Melville, um, that is scary. And so I think that um, when you have a board that is um, you know, half the old guard who's used to, that's how the Rosenbach is, um, and the new guard of folks who want to use the Rosenbach as um, a way to explore different kinds of literature, different kinds of voices, uplift different kinds of people, um, but all care about the Rosenbach very much. Um, it can, can get a little messy because there is question of like, well, what are we doing here? And is that still, are we still being true to the Rosenbach? So, um, ways to get our board on board with DEA initiatives. Um, you have to have, or I did anyway, I had to have multiple approaches. So not only is this um, just the right thing to do, um, but I'm also one of the only BIPOC staff who's saying, let me tell you about my experience going into arts and culture institutions um, in the city. And you know, maybe you can relate to that. And I, you know, you know who I am very well. So let me talk to you um, on that more intimate level. And then if, you know, that's still not really, you know, ringing a bell with them, um, you can always come at it from like the financial practical side of saying, you know, DAI practices are important because that is how, you know, museums like us, especially small ones, are moving into the future. We need to diversify our programming and what we explore in the collection because the collection is already diverse. Um, we just haven't chosen to explore those sections. So when you open more voices in the collection, you will also um, attract more members of the community. And when you choose to offer free programming and take away those barriers of you know, admission fees and having to be a member at $55. You are also opening um, us more to the community and to more people. So you, know, you put all those things together and suddenly your board is like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and often you'll find that your board's not opposed to any of those things. It's just a very different way of thinking um, because Again, arts and culture in Philadelphia, it's, it's traditional and everyone's trying to really navigate, you know, moving into this new era um, slowly, but. So by using these different approaches, you're sort of uh, showing everybody that you're, there is not as the downside that you might think there is or that you're afraid there is. Right. Uh, Al, did you have similar experiences or? Yeah, very much so. It's a, I mean, it's a very large board. Uh, this is probably one of the largest boards I've had to interact with. Um, but I think they, you know, they have had some 
articulable goals and much like many other cultural institutions always sit kind of in a space of, you know, believing that DEAI like goals are sometimes sitting beside the overall goals of the institution. So a lot of the buy-in uh, is really about breaking down that that kind of wall to, to show that they're actually the same goals, you know. Um, broadening our appeal to a more diverse audience is generally equated with bringing more people into the door, as folks say. We talk about expanding our collection. Every day we work towards acquiring new works, of course. So, I mean, let's think about how we're going about doing that work. And then really getting people to, in some ways, talk about, I think, the, the opportunities. Like language matters so much with the board. Um, so I try to really work on having our board not shape, I think, every approach to DEAI as an issue or a challenge, but instead an opportunity. So we've been really, really fortunate to have a lot of board members that have picked up on that. I have a, a committee, a standing committee, um, that actually are a DEIA committee, you know, which is pretty neat. And a lot of organizations, I think, are looking for ways to kind of establish permanence to these efforts. We don't want to see it as trendy, you know? Um, and I think the way in which they are going about doing it, at least right now, is to, to recognize that you kind of have to go through some formality when dealing with the board of either establishing a, you know, a new office or establishing a new rule or a new policy, whatever it is, uh, even in small organizations. It's really important that you have the board who ultimately likely has a responsibility for governance and oversight to really be committed to reflecting, I think, these values in ways through their role um, that hopefully model the practice for other leaders. Plus, they are ultimately some of our best ambassadors, you know, uh, which is great. They share a story of an institution uh, in ways that oftentimes museum staff. Um, just don't, you know, and it's not to say that they don't have a story, they just simply have a different story, you know, so um, that's probably the best way I can say to gain buy and get people to really speak in opportunity language and not so much in the, the problem with, you know, because board members are usually pretty quick to point out all the issues and I'm like, ah, let's talk about the opportunity instead. Uh, Alan, I wanted to follow up on your experience because you're coming to the museum world from higher academia. Mm -hmm. Uh, are there any major differences that you've noticed or observed? Yeah, you know, it's a, um, it, it really is, it is kind of regimented in, in the granted, I think every cultural institution likely is different, but this one um, is in some ways very much like uh, the university framework. I think we have had perhaps in the university framework, uh, a bit more practice, quite frankly, uh, at really developing what these kind of value infused behaviors look like as far as developing policies and thinking about everything from talent acquisition and recruitment to creating environments that are not only, of course, safe, but that center wellness, you know. Uh, so harm mitigation and understanding, I think, identity affirmation in all of its forms is a it's a big part of the university construct. And I think in this particular um, museum, we're learning that construct for the first time, you know? Um, so I, <laughs> I, I've joked with somebody, I'm like, yeah, the first time I talked about minimizing harm was probably about 20 years ago, actually. <laughs> so, but it's as if we're having these conversations again, but that's what keeps us involved. You know, I always tell people, I'm like, you have to, you have to be optimistic when you do this work. And you also have to not be offended by having uh, very similar conversations, although not the same, multiple times. So, and that's, you know, that's been neat. But yeah, I think it's, museums have a, much like universities, a parallel in that there have been very kind of exclusive practices that have been associated with museums. Uh, so dealing with those legacies in the university context led to you know, land acknowledgments and names on buildings and ways in which we kind of engaged, I think, our broader public collectively. Uh, I think museums have gone through a lot of that work themselves. Uh, I think they just might be a little later in the game than a lot of academic institutions, so. 
Uh, that actually brings me to a different question. When we think about perception and perception of museums, what do you think potential employees, visitors, and partners picture when they hear that an organization or an institution is actively aiming for DEI? I can speak to that. Um, we're a very young organization. We're heading into our 10th year. And um, we're a very person-centered organization. Um, almost all of our donors, almost all of our program participants know me. Um, and one of the things we had to think about starting in 2018 was as we um, take on a more overtly, purposefully, explicitly um, inclusive and um, diversity-centered approach. Um, are the people who have been with us since 2013 going to start worrying a little bit that we're, you know, I'll refer of by for all has this sort of Venn diagram where this community is this circle, this community is this circle, and the goal is not to move from one circle to the other and leave out that old circle, but to find where they can constructively intersect, right? And also to acknowledge, particularly if resources are limited, that you have to be really thoughtful and careful about how you do this. Um, I had a conversation, kind of surprised me a little bit. I had a conversation with one of our longtime um, program participants. She was the care partner for her husband. Um, um, and she acknowledged that she really admired our increasing emphasis on working in the neighborhoods of Philadelphia, um, but that she wondered if that meant that we were going to abandon people living with dementia on the main line. Um, so I think that clued me to the fact that I had to be attentive to both honoring the people who were becoming a very, very central part of our community and our identity, and also continuing to support and honor the people who had, frankly, helped the organization to survive its first three, first three years. Um, I will also say that there were some fireworks at the board level at my organization in 2020. Um, and we lost, or there were, there were partings of ways, let's just say. Um, and um, I think it's, it, it was important for us to be very explicit with our audiences about the fact that we are doing this because our mission says we're going to serve people with dementia and a large percentage, the majority of people with dementia happen to be in communities of color. So we're either fulfilling our mission or we're not. Um, I got a lot of very positive feedback about that way of approaching DEI. Um, but that's a little bit of a window into what we experienced. So it seems to be going back to what Bethany was talking about earlier about messaging and showing growing inclusivity rather than a switch of focus from one group to another group. Uh, any other thoughts on perception or, or what people might be considering? Um, 
so yeah, so for per perception, I think for a lot of museums like ourselves, um, the first thought might be, I don't believe you. <laughs> and you know, why should they? Um, so you have to put it in writing and you have to have some stakes in it. You know, you can't just say, you know, the Rosenbach is committed to um, DAI and we want to, you know, do better. That's not good enough. It doesn't mean anything. So you really need to make measurable goals and have dates that you will report back on and be able to share those results and also be willing to share, you know, where you fell short and what's the plan to make sure that you can be better next time. So um, it is a very vulnerable thing to say, you know, we are going to increase diversity in leadership and in staff by 25% and we will make sure that the board is made up at least, you know, this percentage um, of BIPOC individuals. Um, but I think without that vulnerability and accountability, then those are just words in a social media post. So um, perception, that is um, not the duty of your constituents. Um, that is really, you know, that's what you need to work with. That's your ground zero. Uh, and just a note on the Rosenbach's goals they have on their website a uh, page that has their commitments and we put that in the chat. Uh, so if you'd like to view those commitments, you can go to the link. Uh, same question, Alan, you're coming from such a large organization that has such a large staff of both full-time and part-time employees. So there's a lot of it's perception of the employees themselves. Yeah, I mean, I would say that managing, I think, the perception of the DEIA or DEAI approach for a museum of this size, it competes with its own history, I think, of what likely many have seen as, you know, kind of exclusive practices for sure. Um, but it is important, I think, to not negate immediately the power of those words. Like, I can't stress enough how many people have not taken the step to actually put forward statements of principles or commitments. And I think what happens is that sometimes when faced with the absolute, I think, weight, the depth of what can be perceived by many as a challenge, again, of DEAI, like we ourselves, the people who are doing, I believe, some of our best work, won't give ourselves enough credit for actually saying we did something because we're like, oh, we should have already done that. We should have been doing that. And I always have to remind people, I'm like, look, I would prefer that you remain optimistic in this only because as one who identifies as a black man, newly minted in Philadelphia, I will say, like I have seen this work happen across the country and quite frankly, over the world. It's been really interesting, at least in my own professional journey. And I've yet to see any one institution, even with goals, proper metrics, and doing, I think, the best of their possible intention to get it right, get it right, <laughs> right? It's always been a work in progress. And I think that's difficult for a place like even our museum to understand that being a work in progress in and of itself is the closest we will get to perfection in this field. Um, we have an expectation for excellence, I think, in everything we deliver. And I would imagine all institutions do. Certainly cultural institutions were meeting the needs, I think, of communities and art lovers in many different ways. But the perfection that I think sometimes people equate with having these public pronouncements and actually being able to show progress, the progress itself is worth celebrating. The progress is absolutely worth noting, but don't think for a second that the progress in any way actually is going to completely eliminate what is undoubtedly something that is much, much larger than we typically give credit for, which is just our, our section of you know what we can do to contribute to minimizing harm and our little section of what we can do to hopefully changing one mind perhaps or persuading one person to simply think about the choices that they make 
you know, that, that to me is powerful, you know, and, and, and I'm so proud of my colleagues for actually leaning into this work, recognizing that even with the best pie charts, sometimes we still may not quite get there, but I promise you are moving in the right direction. And it's, it's a story that quite frankly, I'm trying to not only share with this museum, um, but I'm also trying to provide the evidence to respond, as I oftentimes say, to very legitimate critique. You know, all of us must be willing and able to provide that evidence of what we are doing, but we have to come together around, I think, a sense that the work will not only continue and it'll be ongoing, but that we actually enjoy it. <laughs> that we lead into the work because we love it and we love hopefully each other and we have a compassion for I think humanity that showcases itself in the way in which we do our work you know that ultimately I yeah it's I, I always get people to hopefully understand that significant um, only because I've seen many people accomplish goals and still recognize that there were still other things to do and sometimes lose motivation because they thought that finishing this thing, if we hire just three more people of color, will be great. And I'm like, okay, that, <laughs> that may not work, but you know, I'll watch you try. You know, you would forgive me, but I, that is certainly what I would offer for how you manage those expectations and people's perceptions. I uh, know it's a it's a great point and. I think there's a lot of institutions out there who really want to start with some form of organization within DAI, but they just don't know what those small steps to take are. Uh, what is everyone's advice for small practical steps that people can take to really actively engage with diversity and equity? Big question, I know. No, if I may, um, I I love that question because I it's something that I'm dealing with right now. You know, we can establish committees, uh, task forces, uh, even you know I talk about it like you know I have organizational entities that are about to be unfurled at the museum. But I think if anything, that the biggest thing is just a, a sense of wanting to learn, um, wanting to know more. Uh, there's a role for curiosity, right, in all organizations, and certainly I think amongst a lot of cultural institutions, so much, so much of the work of cultural institutions is rooted in, I think, professing what we know, right, putting forward what we believe to be the best offer and service of communities, and, and great organizations tend to be um, more, I think, motivated by what they don't know. And what's great about that is we have so many dedicated individuals who are well-intentioned that I would say a first step, if you know any organization that is about to, to dive into, I think, potentially transformative work is to be motivated by what you don't know. You know, uh, feel as if you can embody the space of ambiguity with a sense of maybe a degree of comfort. You know, and that'll take time and practice, but it absolutely has been, you know, I, I didn't necessarily give a full biography when I, when I entered this, but this is my 25th year of, you know, working specifically in the diversity, equity, and inclusion field. We, we constructed as DEAI in the cultural space, um, but it's been interesting in watching that be the, the through line of excellence in those organizations that have been most successful. They're always motivated by what they don't know, you know? So they are kind of relentless in pursuing feedback, just pursuing engagement, whether it be an internal stakeholder or someone in the community, they want to know more, so. So mindset and curiosity and conscious motivation is, you can't bypass that, you need that. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted well, to- oh, Yeah, Susan. So go for it. If I could just say, I think, I mean, professing what we don't know, I, I think that is so crucial. Um, really, really quick story. Um, our work in North Philly started when I was invited in 2017 to speak at Esperanza Health Center in Hunting Park. 
to a um, an audience of community elders that was um, two thirds Spanish speaking and one third English speaking or bilingual. Um, and the program manager translated for me. Um, and the group was so, so, I mean, so validating, lots of nodding, lots of smiling, wonderful. Um, and when it was time to ask questions, one of the people who had been particularly just beaming and nodding stood up and in Spanish asked the question, how do you expect us to feel welcome at your programs if they're only in English? Um, and my response and everything we've done ever since was, number one, that's the best question anyone's asked me in a very long time. And number two, the only way you're going to feel welcome is if we learn from you. And I think what I would add to what Al said is, enduring humility, knowing that you don't know. It's not even a question whether or not you know, you don't know. Um, and then going to the teachers who can teach you and that is the community members. Um, so yeah, so Al, what you said I think was quite inspiring. Thanks, Susan. So also making sure that there's clear communications in both ways, not just museum to community, but also reaching out and making sure that the community can and will engage with you. Uh, Bethany, if you had anything specific, great, but also I was curious if you had any practical steps on committee forming. Um, so practicality. I think for my efforts at the Rosenbach, uh, everything always comes back to, um, you know, if you really are saying that something's a priority, you have to back it with funding. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we started, um, even before summer 2020, we were planning this large exhibition on Alice Dunbar Nelson, who is an incredible poet, um, suffragette, activist, uh, everyone should look her up, she's great. Um, and she is a black, was a black woman. Um, and so we knew that we do not have any um, people who can speak to that. So why should we be making an exhibition about a black woman if we don't have anyone who has that same life experience on staff who's working on it? So um, we prioritized putting aside um, funding so that we could create a community advisory council. And we asked um, members of our board and people that we work with in other organizations to help us um, curate that advisory committee. And so we had a group of about 20 um, and they are still listed on that page. I can find the link for you. Um, and it was an incredible group and we made sure to tell them that, you know, you will be compensated for your time because, you know, we want your help in curating this exhibition, but we also value it. And here is a stipend to tell you that we value that um, knowledge and everything that you can help us to make this exhibition um, true to Alice Dunbar and Nelson's life. Um, and then in other ways, you know, when it comes back to money is that um, one of my commitments that I thought was just really easy is making sure that our vendors um, are either owned by people of color or that they significantly support communities of color. Um, and I think that a trap that nonprofits can fall into quite often, especially when you're our size, is that you have the intention of wanting to use vendors that are owned by people of color. But by the time that you get to the project and say, okay, I need to send this thing to the printer, you are out of time because you were one person and you're doing five different jobs and you say, you know, I'm just gonna go with the printer, you know, Joe, I know him, I'll know how to do it fast. So I'm just gonna send it to him because I, I just don't have time. So if that's really a priority for you, then you also need to make priority in investigating, um, you know, different vendors. You need to, you know, in, in times of the year that are slow, you need to like reach out to those people, um, ask for samples, you know, do a Zoom call, um, figure out if you want to work with them. And I always recommend to create a um, 
a vendor spreadsheet. And so as you're finding really good leads, you know, ask um, your colleagues, ask other friends and nonprofit, like, who do you use? Who do you like? You know, how fast is their turnaround? Um, you know, how quickly do they actually get things to the post office? Um, these are things you can do in times of year that you know are slow and just build that list. Um, you know, everyone can kind of chip into it so that you know when it's time to go that you can just refer to it and you know, like this is a good person. So um, that is one really practical thing that I think everyone can do. And that is, um, you know, putting funds um, where it will actually make an impact. Um, and I think that's something that like every department can do too. Um, in terms of building your committee, um, like I said, you know, I, I talk to my staff first and then I ask my staff to um, think about their networks um, because we all work with different kinds of people. So collections works with other curators. They work with other people that work in collections. They work with a lot of vendors. Um, you know, people who work in visitor services, they are, you know, the front lines of the museum. So they get to know everyone that comes through the doors. They get to know the guides really well because they're sitting in the same area. Um, and then programs folks, you know, they work with lots of different people to, you know, put on programs. So they know a lot of people from other organizations as well. So when you think about all these different staff members and points of contact, um, that's actually a pretty massive network. And then in some way, they all have a stake in the Rosenbach and wanting to see it do well. So um, start with your staff and then have them think, um, you know, in a non-traditional way about who would care about you making sure that you reach your DAI goals. Using put, in your email, put in your newsletter. Newsletter. <laughs> Yeah. So you think your staffs in each individual staff member's network can can really flesh out. And I like the it's always put your money where your mouth is. All right. So we have about eight minutes left. If you have questions uh, for our participants, if you'd like to put them into the chat. And again, that could be general questions or questions for anyone specifically. or just a word prompt, whatever you would like to hear about. As we're waiting for maybe or maybe not people to do that. I was gonna follow up on Bethany's point. Yeah. Just really quickly, it's an excellent point because, you know, resource allocation is always at the end of the day, like, let's just make sure we get this done. But, you know, whether it be chambers of commerce, the existing networks that are in multiple communities, finding, I think, vendors, like especially from historically underrepresented backgrounds, is really, it's, it's pretty easy. Actually, it's not hard to do. I think it's one of those things where once you really put your mind to it, you realize it's like, wow, there are a lot of people who actually could help me operate, you know, either execution on a project or, you know, run the entire museum, quite frankly. If I really just look for them, <laughs> it kind of goes toward talent acquisition too. But, but I would absolutely say, given what I've seen a lot of engagement in different divisions, whether it be collections or education, et cetera. Yeah, there, there are folks out there, you know, who are absolutely, I think, looking to engage. And I would also encourage this collaboration between organizations to actually share those resources. Uh, it only goes to the benefit of the vendor themselves. So more often than not, you'd be surprised how, you know, one person being used by one particular entity get spread of their success, like by word of mouth, which is really great. So, you know, certainly one contract turns into 10. You know, so absolutely, you know, share. Like I know we're building, I think a lot of that database and I have no doubt that we would be more than happy, I think, to engage in sharing it. All right. Thanks, Al. And yes, agreed. An interesting thought on collaboration between organizations and institutions, which we do sometimes in Philly. Um, Kat had a question uh, where she asks, do any of your organizations have it written into job descriptions that folks being hired are committed to this kind of work or in continuing to learn about best practices in DEAI, D 
DIEA and so on, and anti-racism work. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, thanks. Um, comprehensive training, generally speaking, uh, it's been identified multiple uh, ways, but yeah, it's certainly part of the entire responsibility of this office, for sure. Again, we have been going through a rash of uh, hiring. So anyone you know, knows someone who can be a development associate, let me know. Um, but at the end of all of our job posts, we do um, put that line there that says all applicants should be committed to um, our DAI efforts. And it is part of the interview process as well. And I would say it's part of our interview process, but I'm hearing uh, it should be right there in the postings. So I'm learning. Hi. <clears throat> Diane from Mishner just emphasized uh, liking the idea of sharing with vendors and identifying them. Hi. And depending on where you are, it might be a little bit more difficult if you are outside of the city versus in the city. I, and one question is, is there one number one do not do as we are moving forward in DAI practices? I have a rule and it, it, I, I feel like all of us on this call could probably create a list of 3000 do not do's, <laughs> but, but I'm dead serious. I um, do not allow somebody's cynicism to step on your cloud. It, it, this is not, this is not the work of the cynical. Like I, I, I cannot say that any more clearly. And I mean that really in policy and in practice. You know, it's one thing to be skeptical, and I welcome skepticism. Please ask me to prove something, but cynicism, no place for it. Like this, this is work that is in service of all of us, right? So, yeah, do not, do not lean into any of this work with cynicism, please. And I would just echo what we were talking about earlier. Do not think for a moment that you can possibly do this work without the integral involvement of the people that you are supposedly doing the work for. And do not think that it is for somebody else. It's for all of us. Um, and I would say do not shame people for what they don't know. Um, I think that if you truly have a commitment to this work, then you are going to understand that you need to meet people where they are. Um, and everyone's at a different point in their journey. So um, just because someone doesn't know all the terms or they're confused or they don't really know why it's important to do this or that, um, that doesn't make them a bad person. You know, if you're having that conversation in the first place, that's a good thing. So don't shame people because you're actually just going to end up hurting yourselves and the work that you're doing. And you're just going to start all the way over um, or make that person just really dig their heels in even more. So um, if you do this work, you have to have a strong stomach and you need to be patient and understand that there's a lot of empathy that goes into it. Um, which might feel funny sometimes when, because you're thinking like, why do I have to be the empathetic one? Um, but if you have a commitment to this work again, um, you're gonna need a lot of it. Okay, uh, it's a good ending question. I know there are a couple of other questions and I believe all our panelists said that uh, people can reach out to them. Am I saying that correctly? Don't haunt them, but you can reach out to them if you have particular uh, extra questions that maybe they could help you out with. 
Uh, you can also check our website, because I believe we also have contact web, uh, information on our website. Oh, and here are the emails on our chat. But if you look at Museum Council website, you can also see that. And we should also have uh, this panel up there as well. Thank you guys so much. Thanks everyone who came and thank you so much for, to our panelists. Uh, it's been so informative. And I think a lot of people will feel inspired moving forward. Not cynical. <laughs>